attract and repel through verbal communications. Regardless of who you are, you are a wonderful person. Yet certain individuals may not think so. If you feel that they react unfavorably with unwarranted antagonism to the many things you say and do, you can do something about it. They are just as human as you are. You have the power to attract and repel. You can use this power wisely to attract the right friends and repel those who have an undesirable or injurious influence on you. With a negative mental attitude, you are apt automatically to repel the good things in life and attract the undesirable, including the wrong kind of friends. Undesirable reactions on the part of others may be due to what you say and how you say it, or because of your true inner feelings and attitudes. The voice, like music, is often a reflection of the mood, attitude, and hidden thoughts of the mind. It may be just as difficult for you to realize that the fault lies with you as it is for you to take the initiative and correct yourself when you realize the fault does at times lie with you. But you can do it. You can learn from a good salesman, for he is forced to train himself to be sensitive to the reactions of prospective customers and do something about it. The customer is always right attitude of successful merchants is a most difficult attitude for some individuals to adopt, yet it gets results. If you would endeavor to make your relatives happy with the same positive mental attitude that a salesman uses to sell his merchandise to prospective customers, your home and social life would become a more happy and successful one. That is, if you have a problem of personality conflict at home. If your feelings are frequently hurt because of what people say or how they say it, it is quite likely that you yourself are frequently guilty of offending others by what you say or how you say it. Try to determine the true reasons for your reactions of hurt feelings and then avoid causing the same reactions in others. If gossip offends you, you can assume that you shouldn't gossip or you will offend others. If you find someone's tone of voice and attitude toward you objectionable, avoid offending others by speaking or acting in the same manner. If you are not happy when someone yells at you in an angry voice, assume that it is repellent to another if you yell at him, even though he is your five-year-old son or a very close relative. If you feel offended because another person misunderstands your intent, show your confidence. Give other persons the benefit of the doubt. If you do not find arguments, sarcasm, humor with a personal sting, or criticism of your ideas, friends, or relatives pleasant, it is logical to assume that others will not find them pleasing either. And if you like to be complimented, if you like to be remembered, if it makes you happy to know that someone thinks of you, you can safely assume that others will be happy if you compliment them, or remember them, or drop them a note to let them know you are thinking of them. A letter can bring happiness. Absence makes the heart grow fonder, if letters are exchanged. For many a marriage has taken place because love grew stronger through absence. Poetry, imagination, romance, idealism, ecstasy develop warmth and understanding through the exchange of letters. Each individual can express thoughts that might never be expressed if the written word is not used as the medium. Letters of endearment need not and should not stop with marriage. Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain, wrote loving notes to his wife daily even when they were at home. They lived a life of real happiness together. You are what you think. To write, you must think. When you write a letter, you crystallize your thinking on paper. Your imagination is developed by recollecting the past, analyzing the present, and perceiving the future. The more often you write, the more you take pleasure in writing. By asking questions, you as the writer direct the mind of the recipient into desired channels. You can make it easy for him to respond to you. Thus, when he does, he becomes the writer and you receive additional joy as the recipient. The receiver of the letter you write is forced to think in terms of you. If your letter is well thought out, both his reason and his emotions can be directed along desired paths. Inspiring thoughts will be imprinted indelibly in his memory 
when they are being recorded in his subconscious mind as he reads. Can you attract happiness? Yes, of course you can attract happiness. How? You can attract happiness with PMA. A positive mental attitude will attract to you all the health, wealth, and happiness you desire. And a positive mental attitude consists of such plus characteristics as faith, hope, charity, optimism, cheer, generosity, tolerance, tact, kindliness, honesty, good finding, initiative, truthfulness, straightforwardness, and good common sense. Contentment As a nationally syndicated columnist, Napoleon Hill once wrote an article entitled Contentment. You may find it helpful. Here is what it said. The richest man in all the world lives in Happy Valley. He is rich in values that endure, in things he cannot lose, things that provide him with contentment, sound health, peace of mind, and harmony within his soul. Here is an inventory of his riches and how he acquired them. I found happiness by helping others to find it. I found sound health by living temperately and eating only the food my body requires to maintain itself. I hate no man, envy no man, but love and respect all mankind. I am engaged in a labor of love with which I mix play generously. Therefore, I seldom grow tired. I pray daily, not for more riches, but for more wisdom with which to recognize, embrace, and enjoy the great abundance of riches I already possess. I speak no name save only to honor it, and I slander no man for any cause whatsoever. I ask no favors of anyone except the privilege of sharing my blessings with all who desire them. I am on good terms with my conscience, therefore it guides me accurately in everything I do. I have more material wealth than I need because I am free from greed and covet only those things I can use constructively while I live. My wealth comes from those whom I have benefited by sharing my blessings. The estate of Happy Valley, which I own, is not taxable. It exists mainly in my own mind, in intangible riches that cannot be assessed for taxation or appropriated except by those who adopt my way of life. I created this estate over a lifetime of effort, by observing nature's laws and forming habits to conform with them. There are no copyrights on the Happy Valley Man's success creed. If you will adopt it, the creed can bring you wisdom, peace, and contentment. In his book, The Power of Faith, Rabbi Louis Bienstock said this on the subject of happiness. Man was born together, all of one piece. It is the kind of world he has fashioned that has torn him apart. A world of folly, a world of falsehood, a world of fear. With the power of faith, let him put himself together again. Faith in himself, faith in his fellow men, faith in his destiny, faith in his God. Then and only then will the world be truly together. Then and only then will man find happiness and peace. Remember, if the man is right, his world will be right. He can attract happiness just as he can attract wealth, unhappiness, or poverty. Is your world right? Or are guilt feelings keeping you from winning the success you want? If so, you will want to listen to our next chapter, to ensure happiness in your life. Pilot number 18. Thoughts to Steer By 1. Abraham Lincoln once said, It has been my observation that people are just about as happy as they make up their minds to be. Will you make up your mind to be happy? If not, will you make up your mind not to be unhappy? 2. There is very little difference in people but that little difference makes a big difference. The little difference is attitude. The big difference is whether it is positive or negative. 3. One of the surest ways to find happiness for yourself is to devote your energies toward making someone else happy. 4. If you search for happiness, you will find it elusive. But if you try to bring happiness to someone else, 
it will return to you many times over. 5. If you share happiness and all that is good and desirable, you will attract happiness and the good and desirable. 6. If you share misery and unhappiness, you will attract misery and unhappiness to yourself. 7. Happiness begins at home. Members of your family are people. Motivate them to be happy just like a good salesman motivates his prospects to buy. 8. When two forceful personalities are opposed, and it is desirable that they live together in harmony, at least one must use the power of PMA. 9. Be sensitive to your own reactions and to the reactions of others. 10. Would you like to live contentedly in Happy Valley? To be happy, make others happy. Chapter 19 Get Rid of That Guilt Feeling You have a guilt feeling. That's good. But get rid of that feeling of guilt. A sense of guilt is good, and every living person, regardless of how good or bad he may be, will sometimes experience a feeling of guilt. This feeling is the result of a still, small voice speaking to you, and your conscience is that still, small voice. Now think for a moment. What would happen if one did not feel a sense of guilt after doing wrong? For the person who does not have a feeling of guilt for doing a specific wrong act is often unable to distinguish between right and wrong, or hasn't been trained to know the difference between right and wrong as regards that act or he may not be sane. For many feelings of guilt are inherited, and others are acquired. We know a mental conflict often will develop when inherited emotions and passions are bridled by the society in which one lives, and people in one environment may have an entirely different code of ethics that is opposed to the code of those in another. Yet in each instance where the individual has been taught a specific ethical standard and violates it, he develops a feeling of guilt. In some instances, however, the violation of a moral standard of society is good because the standard itself may be bad. And we reiterate, a feeling of guilt is good. It even motivates persons of the highest moral standards to worthwhile thought and action. For there was a righteous man who hated and unrelentingly persecuted people of a religious minority but he developed a feeling of guilt, and the world knows he righted his wrong when his feelings of guilt motivated him to desirable action. For he became a great evangelist, and his thoughts, words, and actions have changed the history of the world during the past two thousand years. Saul of Tarsus was his name. And then there was a man whose feeling of guilt for what he believed to be the misdeeds of his life made him so remorseful that he too was motivated to desirable action. In prison he spent his days writing a book, and his book is a classic reference for teaching nobility of character and beauty of life. John Bunyan was his name. And then there was also the sinner we discussed in chapter 15, who donated a half million dollars to the Chicago Boys Clubs and who also donated a million dollars to his church. Now he did this to atone in part for his guilt for he provided money to prevent boys and girls from falling into the traps and snares of life that he had experienced. Even a benefactor to mankind, like Dr. Albert Schweitzer, was motivated by the sense of guilt, for he felt guilty that he had fallen short of his responsibilities to his fellow men, and because he could but was not doing something worthwhile, his sense of guilt prompted him to start his great mission. Now do you see that a feeling of guilt with PMA is good, but then there is a feeling of guilt with NMA, and that is bad. For not every guilt feeling brings about beneficial results. Now when the individual has a guilt feeling and does not get rid of that guilt feeling with PMA, the results are often most harmful. And the great psychologist Sigmund Freud says, The further our work proceeds, and the deeper our knowledge of the mental life of neurotics penetrates, the more clearly two new factors force themselves upon our notice, which demand the closest attention as sources of resistance. They can both be included under the one description of need to be ill or 
need to suffer. The first of these two factors is the sense of guilt or consciousness of guilt. And Sigmund Freud is right. For feelings of guilt have motivated men to destroy their lives, mutilate their bodies, or injure themselves in other ways to atone for their wrongdoing. Now today, fortunately, such methods are seldom practiced, and they are not permitted in civilized countries. Yet their counterpart can be found, for the conscious mind may not feel guilty, but the subconscious mind does. And the subconscious mind never forgets. And it uses its powers as effectively as the conscious mind, for it fulfills the need of the individual who doesn't rid himself of the feeling of guilt with PMA. It makes him ill. It makes him suffer. A guilt feeling can teach you consideration for others. Consideration for others is a quality each of us has to learn to develop. The newborn babe cares little for the comfort and convenience of anyone else. He wants what he wants when he wants it. So right at that point in his development, he begins to learn, little by little, that there are others alive too, and that to some extent at least, he will have to allow them some consideration. But selfishness is a common human trait and it lessens in each of us only through development. When we get old enough to understand that such feelings are not good, we feel a twinge of guilt when we indulge in selfishness. This is good, for it causes us to think twice when the occasion arises, and we can choose between pleasing ourselves or pleasing others concerned. Thomas Gunn's six-year-old grandson was visiting him at his home in Cleveland, Ohio. The youngster would run to the corner every evening to meet his grandfather when he returned from work. This made the grandfather very happy. When the youngster met him, he would give his grandson a small bag of candy. One day, the boy ran to the corner and greeted his grandfather in excitement and anticipation with, Where's my candy? The elderly gentleman tried to conceal his emotion. Did you meet me every evening? He hesitated before continuing, just for a bag of candy? The boy was handed the small bag that his grandfather had taken out of his pocket. Nothing more was said as they walked to the house. The child was hurt. He was unhappy. He didn't eat the candy. It didn't seem desirable anymore. He had injured someone whom he loved. That night, as the six-year-old and his grandfather knelt down and said their prayers aloud together, the youngster added one all his own. Please, God, let Grandfather know I love him. The boy's unhappiness and remorse because of what he had done were good. Why? Because they forced him to take action to get rid of that guilt feeling and make amends for what he had done. To get rid of that guilt feeling, make amends. Feelings of guilt can arise from many varied causes, but a sense of guilt brings with it a feeling of indebtedness indebtedness that must be reduced and eliminated. And this is very well illustrated by the story of the young doctor in Lloyd C. Douglas's novel, The Magnificent Obsession. For you will recall that in that story, the young man who is the hero felt that he owed the world a debt because his life had been saved at the cost of the life of a great brain surgeon who had been a real blessing to the world. But it was this feeling of debt which caused the young man to become a brain specialist equal in ability to the man whose life he felt he had taken. And from the diary of the man who had gone on, the young man learned a philosophy of life which caused him to develop a magnificent obsession. Thus, because of his guilt feeling, he too became a worthwhile person. Now every story is somebody's story, and every day in your daily newspaper you read somebody's story. Someone like Jim Voss, whose life was saved in more ways than one because he responded to an irrevocable decision to get rid of his feeling of guilt, for he got into action. To get rid of that guilt feeling, get into action. Sometimes people get caught in a web of wrongdoing, and they seem to be unable to free themselves from it. For they give up trying, and then they become more and more entangled until finally it takes an almost earth-shaking experience to set them free. Such was the case with Jim Voss. Jim Voss is a man who literally owes his life to his decision to say, I will, 
and yet this decision came quite late in life. For a good many years, Jim had been running head-on into the commandments. He seemed to be trying to violate them all, one by one. The first time he broke the injunction, Thou shalt not steal, he was still in college. One day he stole $92.74. He went to the airport, bought a ticket, and headed for Florida. A little later he stole again, this time in an armed robbery. He was caught and put in jail. Shortly thereafter, he was granted amnesty so that he could join the army. Yet even in the army he got into trouble. The court-martial read, For diverting government property to private use. And so it went. Jim Voss's career kept sliding downhill. The more often he did wrong, the more guilt he felt. Guilt leads to guilt, as well as lies and deception to hide it. Now Jim didn't consciously feel more guilty because his conscious sense of guilt had become deadened. But not so with his subconscious mind, for that's where the guilt feeling accumulated without Jim's realizing it. And, as in the instances you often read of in your newspaper, it took an earth-shaking experience to awaken him. Now Voss was eventually released from the Army. He married and moved to California, where he set up an electronics consultant business. One day, a man known simply as Andy came to Jim and outlined a big idea for beating the races with an electronic device. Within weeks, Jim was deeply involved with the underworld, and he was driving a $9,000 car. He had a fine home in the suburbs and more business than he could handle. One day, Jim had an argument with his wife. She wanted to know where all the money was coming from, and he wouldn't say, so she started to cry. Jim couldn't stand to see his wife cry, for he loved her. Jim's conscience bothered him. Because he wanted to humor her, he suggested a ride out to the beach. On the way, they got caught in a traffic jam. Hundreds of cars were pouring into a parking lot. Oh, look, Jim, said Alice. It's Billy Graham. Let's go. It might be interesting. And still trying to humor her, Jim went along. But shortly after he sat down, he became emotionally disturbed. It seemed to him that Graham was talking directly to him, for Jim's conscience bothered him so badly that it seemed he had been singled out. Graham's text was, What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Then Graham was saying, There's a man here who has heard all this before, who is hardening his heart. With pride he stiffens his neck, and he is determined to leave without making a decision but this will be his last chance. His last chance? To Jim the thought was startling. Perhaps he had a premonition, or perhaps he was ready. What did the preacher mean? Graham was giving a call to come forward. He wanted people to take a physical step that symbolized a decision. What was happening, Jim wondered. Why did he feel like crying? Suddenly he found himself speaking. Let's go, Alice. Dutifully, Alice walked to the aisle and turned as if to go out of the tent. Jim, who was following her, caught her arm and turned her around. No, dear, he said, this way. Years later, after Jim had changed his life completely, he was giving a speech in Los Angeles. And then he told of his experiences with the underworld. He told about the day of his decision, on which day he had been instructed to fly to St. Louis on a wiretapping assignment. I never reached St. Louis, he said. I found the courage to reach my knees instead. And in his speech, Jim told of his blessings and how he had thanked God for them, asked for forgiveness, had tried to neutralize his wrongdoing, and stressed the application of the golden rule. After the lecture, a lady came up to him and said, Mr. Voss, I think you might like to know something. I was working in the mayor's office at the time you were supposed to go to St. Louis. On that day, a teletype was received from the FBI. It said, Mr. Voss, that you were going to be met in St. Louis by a rival gang and shot dead. A Recommended Formula for Getting Rid of Guilt Your own last chance may not be as dramatic as this, but there is a wonderful lesson in the story of Jim Voss nonetheless. How is Jim able to get rid of his guilt feelings? He did it by following a clear-cut pattern. 
it is the pattern all of us can follow. First of all, you listen as you hear advice, a lecture, an inspirational sermon that could change your life. Then you count your blessings and thank God for them. Feel sincerely sorry and ask for forgiveness. When you realize your blessings, it isn't difficult to become sincerely sorry for the wrongs you have done. And truly to repent. Then you will have the courage to ask for forgiveness from God. You must take the first step forward. This is important because it is a symbol through a physical gesture that you make in the direction of a changed life. When Jim walked down the aisle, he was making a public announcement that he had become sorry for his past and was now ready to change his life. Also, you must make amends by taking the second step forward. Begin immediately to right every wrong. And then the most important step of all, apply the golden rule. This should be easy, for now when you are tempted to do wrong, that still small voice will whisper to you. And when it does, stop and listen. Count your blessings. Picture yourself in the other fellow's place. And then make your decision to do what you would want done if you actually were in his position. So this is the formula for getting rid of your guilt feelings. If you are having trouble with temptation, and if subsequent guilt is keeping you from using your energy in a constructive direction, learn the pattern for freedom from guilt. Relate it to your own life. Apply it and step away toward success. Success through a positive mental attitude urges you to use the powers of your conscious and subconscious mind to seek the truth, motivate you to take constructive action, cause you to strive to achieve the highest ideals you can conceive, consistent with good physical and mental health, live intelligently in your society, help you abstain from that which will cause unnecessary injury, start you from where you are and get you to where you want to be, regardless of what you are or what you have been. Anything which deters you from noble achievements in life should be cast aside, and this places upon you the burden to know or find out what is right or wrong, and to know what is good or evil under a given circumstance and at a given time. You are acquainted with the Ten Commandments, the Golden Rule, and other standards of good in the society in which you live, and it is for you to determine the standards which will guide you to your desired goals. It is one thing to know the goal, and quite another thing to work toward it, writes Bishop Fulton J. Sheen in Life is Worth Living. Choose your goals, work toward them, direct your thoughts, control your emotions, get into action, and you ordain your destiny. You can find the answer if you keep seeking it. How? One important aid is to catch character. Catch Character is something that is caught, not taught, was a thought-provoking quotation of Arthur Berger, former executive director of the Boys Clubs of Boston. It appeared in a Reader's Digest article entitled, 400,000 Boys Are Members of the Club. Catch has two distinct meanings. One, affected by exposure to environment, often subconscious reaction, and two, seize and hold, conscious action. One effective way to catch character is to place yourself or your children in an environment that will develop desirable thoughts, motives, and habits. If your selected environment is not sufficiently effective after a reasonable time, make substitutions and changes. But character can also be taught, and if parents would devote more time to teaching character, both by precept and example, their children would catch and learn this admirable quality so necessary for success. What makes a delinquent? E. E. Bauermeister, former supervisor of education at the California Institution for Men at Chino, California, says, Our youngsters need the guidance in choosing right from wrong, which they should receive at home. When we start talking about juvenile delinquency, we should rename it and put the responsibility where it belongs. We have a case of parent delinquency in America today. Parents are not assuming the obligations and responsibilities that are theirs. 
everyone has been born with a potential of good character. J. Edgar Hoover made this statement, You can read volumes upon volumes as to the cause of crime, but crime is literally caused by the lack of one thing, a feeling of moral responsibility on the part of people. And the reason the people lack a feeling of moral responsibility is because they lack a guilt feeling. Thus, they do not develop their own characters, for their conscience is dulled and doesn't guide them. And from their faulty immoral and amoral characters, their children can neither catch nor learn character. When one virtue is in conflict with another. Sometimes it is not so easy to decide whether one should say yes or no, for the question to be resolved may involve a conflict between virtues, and every person at some time is faced with such a conflict and must make a decision. He must choose between what he wishes to do and what he ought to do, or between what he wants and what society expects of him. And such a choice must necessarily be made between virtues such as love, duty, and loyalty. As examples, a. Love and duty to a parent in conflict with the love and duty to a husband or wife. b. Loyalty to an individual in conflict with loyalty to another individual. Or c. Loyalty to an individual in conflict with loyalty to an organization or society. Let's illustrate with the story of the salesman who worked with George Johnson, for they were faced with a conflict between loyalty to an individual and loyalty to another individual and the organization he represented. George Johnson trained, encouraged, inspired, and financed a salesman whom we will call John Black. George had complete confidence in John. He liked him. He gave him a break. He let him service his best customers long-established accounts. In the company contract, it was agreed that in the event of termination, the salesman would in no way molest the company's business or interfere with its sales organization. Mr. Johnson gave Black the book, Think and Grow Rich. It motivated John to action, the wrong action. John didn't read what was unwritten. His only interest was the acquisition of money. He believed the end justified any means. Because of his negative standards, he responded aggressively with a negative mental attitude. George Johnson is just like a father to me. Yes, I think of him as a father, the salesman said, but at the same time he secretly planned to transfer the company's customers and sales force to a competing concern, for money. John was welcomed in the homes of his fellow salesmen for they were unaware of his thoughts or plans. When he called at their homes, he relied upon the honesty and decency of the individuals to live up to a promise and not to betray his secret. He would ask, How would you like to double your earnings? How would you like to have greater security? The response would be, Sounds good. What's it all about? Black would answer, I don't want anyone to upset the apple cart. Therefore, I'll tell you only if you promise me on your honor not to tell anyone. Do you make a solemn promise? When the answer was yes, he endeavored to entice them over to the competing organization. He tried to neutralize their pangs of conscience by referring to real or imaginary dissatisfactions. The other salesmen were on the spot. On the one hand, they had given John their solemn promise not to tell what he was doing. On the other hand, they knew what he was doing would be harmful to their employer, and they owed a greater loyalty to George Johnson and the organization he represented. The salesman had the courage to try to clear the cobwebs of John's thinking and to show him that what he was contemplating was not right. When he didn't respond but persisted in his own way, they knew what to do. They gave George Johnson the facts. They chose adherence to the virtue of loyalty to their employer. As Abraham Lincoln once put it, they chose to stand with anyone that stands right, stand with him while he is right, and part from him when he goes wrong. These salesmen showed their true characters when they made their decision. They showed that they were men of courage, honesty, and loyalty. They knew how to decide between right and wrong when one virtue was in conflict with another. 
There are many such conflicts. In your life, you will be faced with the necessity to make decisions in instances where virtues are in conflict with other virtues. And what will your decision be? Perhaps the following will aid you. Do that which your conscience tells you will not develop a guilt feeling. It's the right thing to do. To assist you in coming to the right decision under such circumstances, complete the success quotient analysis in the following chapter. Pilot number 19. Thoughts to Steer By 1. You have a guilt feeling. That's good. But get rid of that guilt feeling. 2. To get rid of that guilt feeling, make amends. 3. A recommended formula to help you get rid of guilt is a. Listen to advice, a lecture, sermon, etc., and relate and assimilate the principles. b. Count your blessings and thank God for them. c. Then become truly sorry for your wrongdoings. True sorrow necessarily incorporates a sincere decision to stop the wrongdoing. d. Take the first step forward. Acknowledge your guilt and your intention to make amends. E. Make amends insofar as you are able. F. Memorize, understand, and try to apply the golden rule in your dealings with others. 4. Anything which deters you from noble achievements in life should be cast aside. 5. Character can be caught and taught. 6. What do you do when two virtues are in conflict with one another? 7. The burden is upon you to find what is right or wrong, and to know what is good or evil under a given circumstance and at a given time. One of the best ways to learn is to expose yourself with regularity to a religious environment and to seek divine guidance daily. You have a guilt feeling. That's good but get rid of that guilt feeling. Part 5. Action, please. Negligence Remember that you and you alone can eliminate your real limitations when you learn and employ the art of motivation with PMA. These limitations are 1. A negative mental attitude and your neglect to change to a positive mental attitude. 2. Ignorance through your neglect to learn how to use the powers of your mind. 3. Your neglect to engage in thinking, study, and planning time to set and achieve desirable goals. 4. Your neglect to take the necessary action when you know what to do and how to do it. 5. Your neglect to learn how to recognize, relate, assimilate, and apply universal principles that when applied, can help you achieve any objective you may have that doesn't violate the laws of God or the rights of your fellow men. 6. That which you set up in your own mind or accept as insurmountable. Also remember, negligence is one of the quickest and easiest habits to neutralize and overcome if you want to neutralize and overcome it. Chapter 20 now it's time to test your own success quotient. You have listened to all but the last three chapters of Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude. And now would be a good time to take a look at your own mental attitude. And you can do this for yourself. But before you do, we want you to know our attitude is The burden of teaching is upon the person who wants to teach. And with whom does the burden of learning lie? Perhaps J. Milburn Smith has the answer. Now, J. Milburn Smith rose from assistant to the office boy to president of the Continental Casualty Company of Chicago. He told us, The burden of learning is on the person who wants to learn, not on the person who wants to teach. And he also said, A have-not is a person who believes that an idea is not good for him unless he himself originates it. And I say, copy from success. Everything I have done, I have borrowed from another person or business. And he continued, Be respectful and listen to those who have experience. For the experienced man had something I wanted, 
and that's why I associated with older and successful men. For I took what they had, the good, their knowledge and experience, but not their weaknesses. And then I added this to what I had. Thus I profited even by their mistakes as well as my own. To learn, one must pay the price. And I was willing to pay it, for I was not taught. I learned. Knowledge? You must seek it out. Copy from success, says J. Milburn Smith, and you can begin by asking yourself some questions. Am I willing to pay the price? Am I willing to take the good, the knowledge and the experience, but not the weaknesses of the men I have heard about in this book? And if your answer is yes, then we have a suggestion that we know will help you. But let's first remind you that as you have listened to this book, you have frequently been called upon to answer questions about yourself. And although these may have appeared to have been simple questions, in reality, is there anything harder than to evaluate oneself correctly? Know thyself is probably the most difficult admonition ever given to man. And to assist you to know thyself, the authors have prepared a personal analysis questionnaire which has helped many men and women to do this more satisfactorily. You have already taken many tests, intelligence, aptitude, personality, vocabulary, and all the rest. But this one is different. We call it your success quotient analysis. And it is based on the 17 success principles which have been responsible for the worthwhile achievements of the world's outstanding leaders in all fields. It has many purposes to direct your thoughts in desired channels, to crystallize your own thinking, to indicate your present position on the road to success, to encourage you to decide exactly where you want to be, to measure your chances of reaching your desired destination, to indicate your present ambitions and other characteristics, to motivate you to desirable action with PMA. Our suggestion. And now our suggestion is that you pause this program, print out the success quotient analysis from the PDF included with this program, and immediately try to answer the success quotient analysis thoughtfully and truthfully to the best of your ability. Try not to fool yourself, for this test will be valid only if you answer every question with the truth as you now see it. You have tried to answer the questions in this success quotient analysis searchingly and honestly. If not, you will. Now, the important thing to remember is that these results are not final and unchangeable. If you scored high, it means you will be able to assimilate and practice the principles in this book rather quickly. If your score was not so high, don't despair. Apply PMA. You can achieve great success in life. When you need help from a psychologist to find out what business or profession you may be fitted for, he will frequently ask you to take a battery of tests. The picture that emerges from these tests may show you what your particular tendencies are. However, the psychologist does not regard the result of these tests as final. He always arranges for a personal interview to find out that which a test will not answer. He uses the results of the tests and the interview to counsel you and to evaluate your progress. In the same way, you can use the first score on the questionnaire as a means of measuring your own ever-growing success quotient. Listen to success through a positive mental attitude once more, and again, and again. Listen to it with your husband, wife, or a close friend, discussing it point by point, Listen to it until every principle becomes a part of your life, motivating your every action. Then, when you have earnestly applied these principles for three months, take the SQ test again. Not only will many wrong answers become right ones, but answers you gave correctly the first time will be more emphatic and confident. Your success quotient can serve you as more than a yardstick, however. It can serve to underline those areas where you need to work hardest for self-improvement. It will also reveal your areas of special strength. For your future is ahead of you. You have the power to direct your thoughts and control your emotions, 
just awaken the sleeping giant within you. How? You will find your answer in the next chapter. Pilot number 20. Thoughts to Steer By 1. Review the success quotient analysis frequently until you can truthfully state to yourself, I can now make the right answer to each question. Each of the questions will direct your mind in a specific channel, whereby you can easily determine what you can and should do. 2. There is a value in solving problems or developing desirable habits by asking yourself the proper questions. Write them down, and then, in your thinking time, strive to find the proper solutions to obtain the results you desire. Sow an act, and you reap a habit. Sow a habit, and you reap a character. Sow a character, and you reap a destiny. Chapter 21 Awaken the Sleeping Giant Within You you are the most important living person. Stop and think about yourself. In all the history of the world, there was never anyone else exactly like you. And in all the infinity of time to come, there will never be another. You are the product of your heredity, environment, physical body, conscious and subconscious mind, experience, and particular position and direction in time and space and something more, including powers known and unknown. You have the power to affect, use, control, or harmonize with all of them. And you can direct your thoughts, control your emotions, and ordain your destiny with PMA. For you are a mind with a body. And your mind consists of dual invisible gigantic powers, the conscious and the subconscious. One is a giant that never sleeps. It is called the subconscious mind. The other is a giant which, when asleep, is powerless. When awakened, his potential power is unlimited. This giant is known as the conscious mind. When the two work in harmony, they can affect, use, control, or harmonize with all known and unknown powers. What wouldst thou have? What wouldst thou have? I am ready to obey thee as thy slave. I and the other slaves of the lamp, said the genie. Awaken the sleeping giant within you. It is more powerful than all the genii of Aladdin's lamp. The genii are fictional. Your sleeping giant is real. What wouldst thou have? Love? Good health? Success? Friends? Money? A home? A car? Recognition? Peace of mind? Courage? Happiness? Or would you make your world a better world in which to live? The sleeping giant within you has the power to bring your wishes into reality. What wouldst thou have? Name it, and it's yours. Awaken the sleeping giant within you. How? Think. Think with a positive mental attitude. Now the sleeping giant, like the genie, must be summoned with magic. But you possess this magic. The magic is your talisman, with the symbols PMA on one side and NMA on the other. The characteristics of PMA are the plus characteristics symbolized by such words as faith, hope, honesty, and love. You are launched on a great journey. We have called the resumes at the end of the chapters pilots. That is because you are going somewhere. You are not standing still. You are on your way through rough and often unfamiliar waters. To reach the end of your journey successfully, you will need many of the skills of the navigator. As the compass of a ship is affected by disturbing magnetic influences, requiring the pilot to make certain allowances in order to keep the vessel on its right course, so you must take account of the powerful influences affecting you as you navigate through life. A compass is corrected to give true readings regardless of variation and deviation. The same applies to life, where the variations are environmental influences, and the deviations are the negative attitudes within your own conscious and subconscious mind. You must correct these deviations as they occur in your plotting. Ahead of you may be disappointments, adversities, and dangers. These are the rocks and hidden shoals past which you must sail on your course. 
and this you can do when your compass is compensated for variation. For if you are aware of the coral reefs and tides, you can capitalize on each. You can select the environmental influence of the light of a lighthouse or sound of a buoy to steer a course that will bring you toward your destination without serious mishap. Now when plotting a course, you must rely upon the accuracy of your compass. Compensating the compass is not an exact science. A necessary safeguard is unceasing watchfulness on the navigator's part. It is possible, however, to correct a compass very effectively. Just as a magnetic needle is in direct line with the north and south magnetic poles, so when your compass is compensated, you will automatically react in line with your objective, your highest ideal. And the highest ideal of man is the will of God. This book will now go with you on your journey to success. Success through a positive mental attitude will bring you success, wealth, physical, mental, and spiritual health and happiness when you react favorably to it. Remember what Andrew Carnegie said, Anything in life worth having is worth working for. Awaken the Sleeping Giant In the next chapter, entitled The Amazing Power of a Bibliography, you will discover the art of reading an inspirational book in a manner that will help you to awaken the sleeping giant within you. Pilot number 21. Thoughts to Steer By 1. What wouldst thou have? Love? Good health? Success? Friends? Money? A home? A car? Recognition? Peace of mind? Courage? Happiness? Or would you make your world a better world in which to live? 2. Name it and it can be yours. If you learn and employ the principles found in this book that are applicable to you. 3. Think. Think with a positive mental attitude and follow through with desirable action. 4. Compensate your compass to avoid dangers and thus arrive safely at your chosen destination. 5. The highest ideal of man is the will of God. 6. Awaken the sleeping giant within you. Awaken the sleeping giant within you. Chapter 22. The Amazing Power of a Bibliography This chapter is a bibliography, and this bibliography has amazing potential power. For within it, may lie the hidden button which, when pushed, can be used to unleash the power within you, the untapped, unused, vast resources that you alone possess. And we hope it will start a chain reaction that will help you in achieving true success. For if you want to motivate yourself and others, say it with a book. Say it with a book. In success through a positive mental attitude, the authors have used a technique that has proved exceedingly effective in their writings, lectures, and counseling service. We recommend self-help books which experience has proved cause a desirable and positive reaction in the reader. Now, in the 20th century, America has been particularly fortunate in developing a group of authors who have the unique talent to write in a manner that sows seeds of thought which motivate those who are searching for self-improvement to find it. The reader reacts with desirable action. While some of the books we recommend are out of print, the universal truths contained in them are just as true today as the day they were written. And such books can be obtained from used bookstores or rented from your library. Again, we urge you to read, study, understand, and apply the principles in inspirational self-help action books, magazines, and newspaper articles. Read everything you can find about those who had successful careers in your own field to determine what principles you can use to succeed. Also read success stories about people in other kinds of work and find the common denominator, the principle involved. Share with others a part of what you possess that is good and desirable an inspirational self-help action book, article, editorial, or poem. Now that's what Nate Lieberman has done. For many years, he was a manufacturer's representative. He had a magnificent obsession. 
Over a period of years, he shared thousands of inspirational books with his friends. And it was Nate Lieberman who made Emerson and Mr. Stone close friends with a gift of Emerson's essays. And likewise, he introduced him to the authors of Suggestion and Autosuggestion, The Law of Psychic Phenomena, and Invention and the Unconscious, and many more. Now this sharing of ideas and ideals is a marvelous thing. You give them away and still keep them for yourself, too. Brownie Wise knew this. Brownie needed to support herself and her son who was ill. Her meager salary wasn't enough to pay for her son's medical care. Therefore, she obtained a part-time sales job for Tupperware Home Parties Incorporated to augment her income. She needed money. With it, her son could have the best medical attention they could move to a climate that would help restore his health. Brownie Wise prayed for help. She found it. She read an inspirational book, Think and Grow Rich. She read it once and then read it again. In fact, Brownie read the book six times. Then she recognized the principle she was looking for and something happened. She made it happen. She saw how she could apply these principles to her own situation and these ideas were put into action. It wasn't long before her earnings from Tupperware exceeded $18,000 a year, and within a few years, her income rose to over $75,000 annually. In due course, she became vice president and general manager of the company. Brownie Wise enjoyed the distinction of being recognized as one of the outstanding woman sales managers in the United States. She continued her successful career and eventually became president of Vivian Woodard Cosmetics Corporation. This outstanding businesswoman's success began with a book and continued with a book. Much of her achievement is due to the successful motivation of her representatives. She shared what she had learned from reading Think and Grow Rich. Brownie Wise bought copies of the book for her sales representatives. They were urged to read Think and Grow Rich as many times as she had, and to apply the principles in their own lives. And the story of Lee S. Meitinger and William S. Castleberry, Ph.D., is another example of the value of inspirational self-help action books in the achievement of success. These men help nature bring good health to men, women, and children through the sale of Neutralite, a food supplement which contains vitamins and minerals. Their sales grossed many millions of dollars annually. Meidinger and Castleberry read Think and Grow Rich. They assimilated what they read and got into action. Part of their success was due to their ability to motivate their distributors with mental and spiritual vitamins. They did this with the same book that had inspired them. Each new employee received an inspirational lecture course teaching him the fundamentals of success. They distributed thousands of self-help books because they knew what amazing effects these books have on sales representatives' productivity and success. W. Clement Stone uses inspirational literature extensively in his organization. His company buys thousands of books for distribution to employees, stockholders, and representatives. The success and growth of his companies have been phenomenal, not by accident. How to Read a Book there is an art to reading a self-help book. When you read, concentrate. Read as if the author were a close personal friend and were writing to you and you alone. Now you recall that Abraham Lincoln, when he read, took time for reflection in order that he might relate and assimilate the principles into his own experience. It would be wise to follow his good example. Determine what you are looking for before you read a self-help book. If you know what you are looking for, you are more apt to find it than if you don't have a specific purpose. If you really want to recognize, relate, assimilate, and apply success principles that are contained between the covers of an inspirational book, you must work at it. A self-help book is not to be skimmed through the same way that you might read a detective novel. Mortimer J. Adler, in How to Read a Book, urges the reader to follow a definite pattern. Here's an ideal one. Step A. Read for general content. This is the first reading. 
it should be a fast reading to grasp the sweeping flow of thought that the book contains. But take the time to underline the important words and phrases. Write notes in the margins, and write down briefly the ideas that flash into your mind as you read. Now this obviously may only be done with a book that you own, but the notations and markings make your book more valuable to you. Step B. Read for particular emphasis. A second reading is for the purpose of assimilating specific details. You should pay particular attention to see that you understand and really grasp any new ideas the book presents. Step C. Read for the future. This third reading is more of a memory feat than it is a reading task. Literally memorize passages that have particular meaning to you. Find ways they can relate to problems you are currently facing. Test new ideas. Try them. Discard the useless and imprint the useful indelibly on your habit patterns. Step D. Read later to refresh your memory and to rekindle your inspiration. There is a famous story about the salesman who is standing up in front of a sales manager, saying, Give me that old sales talk again. I'm getting kind of discouraged. All of us may become discouraged. We should reread the best of our books at such times to rekindle the fires that got us going in the first place. We shall list some inspirational self-help action books, a few are instructional, that can motivate you to desirable action. Each contains hidden treasures that you can discover for yourself. But before you go over the list and thus complete success through a positive mental attitude, let us once more remind you, Share with others a part of what you have that is good and desirable, and awaken the sleeping giant within you. Then this book, Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude, will not be an ending. It will be the beginning of a new era in your life. Make the ending what you choose. The Bible A. Let us walk honestly, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Romans 13, verses 13 and 14. B. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, verse 7. C. If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Mark 9, verse 23. D. Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Mark 9, verse 24. E. According to your faith, be it unto you. Matthew 9, verse 29. F. Faith without works is dead. James 9, verse 20. G. What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Mark 11, verse 24. H. If God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, verse 31. I. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Matthew 7, verse 7. J. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Matthew 25, verses 31 through 35. K. Go ye into all the world. Mark 16, verse 15. L. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Romans 7, verse 19. M. For what I would, that I do not. But what I hate, that I do. Romans 7, verse 15. N. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give thee. Acts 3, verse 6. O. The love of money is the root of all evil. 1 Timothy 6, verse 10. P. Thou shalt not steal. Exodus 20, verse 15. In the bibliography included in the PDF file accompanying this program, 
we shall list some inspirational self-help action books. A few are instructional that can motivate you to desirable action. Pilot number 22. Thoughts to Steer By 1. Like Brownie Wise, Meidinger and Castleberry, W. Clement Stone, and many other managers of successful sales organizations, you can motivate yourself and others to desirable action with inspirational self-help books. Books that can be evaluated by actual results achieved by the reader. 2. Brownie Wise found it necessary to read Think and Grow Rich six times before she recognized the principles that she could apply. Then something happened. She made it happen. Develop your mind power by studying success through a positive mental attitude as often as is necessary to understand how to achieve any desirable goal that doesn't violate the laws of God or the rights of your fellow men. 3. When you read an inspirational self-help action book, A. Concentrate. B. Read as if the author were a close personal friend and were writing to you and you alone. C. Know what you are looking for. D. Get into action. Try the principles that are recommended. 4. Evaluate the book Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude by what you actually think and do to make yourself a better person and to make your world a better world for you and others to live in. 5. You are a better person and your world will be a better world in which to live because you have listened to success through a positive mental attitude. Isn't that true? Succeed through PMA. You can if you really want to. Do you? Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude was written by Napoleon Hill and W. Clement Stone and read by David White. It was produced by Cedar House Audio Productions for Simon & Schuster Audio. Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude is also available in paperback from Pocket Books. <laughs>